He goes from about 2 up to 15 microns in wavelength. On an NMR scale, you will see two scales, the wavelength, which almost nobody uses, and the wave number. <clears throat> wave number is kind of a strange concept, but if you express the wavelength in centimeters instead of microns, and then take the reciprocal, you get the wave number. Um, as infrared evolved many years ago, everyone used wave number. Um, I really think it's much easier to remember things in wave numbers than in the wavelength. So we're going to do wave numbers like this. As you um, shine light on your sample, you trace a graph like this, where this is absorbance as a function of wavelength or wave number. <clears throat> the further down this peak goes, the more of that particular radiation, that particular wavelength, is being absorbed by your sample. So a big peak means it's absorbing a lot. A pair is not so much. So let's look at infrared and basically what's happening. Again, our uh, range is roughly 2 to 15 microns, 4,000 to 600 reciprocal centimeters. Every bond in a molecule um, can be defined as having a force constant. So this is the strength of the bond, if you will. <clears throat> this molecule can absorb radiation in the um, infrared region, and as it does, the, if the radiation, the energy in the radiation, perfectly matches the force constant in the bond, the bond will absorb some. And when it does, it undergoes a transition. The transitions that we're mostly interested in are stretching. We'll see this is called a symmetric stretching, and this is an asymmetric stretching. This is an example of a bin. All of these things happen to molecules when they hit just the right wavelength of infrared radiation. Now, the ones that we're mostly interested in, organic molecules are all going to contain carbon and usually hydrogen. So an example of the type of thing we're looking at, this is a symmetric CH stretch. If you shine infrared radiation on an organic molecule with an sp3 carbon and a couple CHs, you can set off a symmetric CH stretch at about 2850 reciprocal centimeters. This will give you a dip in your spectrum and absorbance as that energy is absorbed and converted into the stretching motion. The other stretching motion occurs at about 29, 25, slightly higher energy, and this is the asymmetric stretch. Now virtually all organic molecules are going to have um, CH bonds, so we're going to see this in almost everything. The whole point of the infrared is we're going to take and scan this range and we're going to look for functional group absorbances, characteristic absorbances. We're going to look at those, identify them, and then try to piece together what our molecule looks like. Let's look at a real example here. This is polystyrene. Um, polystyrene film is used um, as a standard actually to calibrate machines and check them out and stuff like that. Um, this little peak right here occurs very precisely at 1601.25 reciprocal centimeters. So that's used again to calibrate the machines, etc. Um, as we look at this molecule, we have a benzene ring and we have a couple CH2s up top. So with these, we would expect to see our symmetric and asymmetric stretches. 
What they look like is these. Here we have the asymmetric at about 29, and the symmetric slightly lower energy at about 28. Little sharp peaks. Now again, this isn't telling us a whole lot because virtually all organic molecules are going to have CH. But it's nice to know that they're there. Well, <clears throat> any questions before we go? What we're going to do is look at different regions in the spectrum and assign those to functional groups. The region down here below about 1500, this gets really complicated. Um, it will be unique for a given molecule and it's referred to as the fingerprint region. Um, this is not simple stretching. These are bendings and waggings and wavings and whoever's. Um, so they're very complicated. The stretchings occur typically above, oh, say 1,500 up to 4,000. Stretchings are the ones we're going to be concerned about. There are a few bands in here that we will talk about that are useful, but mostly we're going to focus on the top end here. So, common functional groups that we're going to look at. At our highest energy, we're going to have OH and NH stretches. Now, we're going to talk about each of these in detail and show examples, but this is just where we're going. OH and NH stretch, typically these are going to be very intense bands, and they'll be very broad. And the infrared spectrum, C3000, there's a little tiny dashed line down here. 3000 is a very, very useful number. If we have stretches, CA stretches that are above that, say 3100, that's typically what we see for SP squared CH or SP. If we have anything above 3000, this region right here, down to about 28. That's our alkane CHs, just like we saw for polystyrene. Moving down towards lower energy, we'll see that in this region right here, uh, not very much absorbs. The one thing that does absorb nicely, though, is an aldehyde. An aldehyde CH will be unique in this region. Makes it really easy to pick out an aldehyde. So right in here are aldehyde CHs. Then we hit about 2200. This is where we start seeing stretches between heavy atoms. So this is a carbon-carbon triple bond um, in a uh, um, alkyne, alkyne, or a carbon-nitrogen triple bond in a nitrile. So that'll be right in that region. Typically these can be sharp and they can be very useful. Carbonyl. The infrared was developed many, many years ago just for the carbonyl. Carbonyl will dominate a spectrum. Very intense, nicely broad band, being all the way down here to the bottom. You can immediately tell if you have a carbonyl. Our carbon-carbon double bond stretch is lower energy. That's the 1601 that we had here, and it typically comes in this region. When we have a benzene ring, quite often we can see, oops, I guess we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's get back to it. Benzene ring. If you look at this pattern right in here, this pattern, that pattern, and these couple of guys. Those are fairly characteristic of a monosubstituted benzene. Um, when those work, they're very useful. Again, this is fingerprints, so sometimes you can't see it. And these guys are actually overtones. So these heavy bands down here um, have harmonics. And this is a little harmonic that shows up there. Um, 
again, when you can see it, it's nice. Uh, quite often you don't see it, though. All right, let's move on to our highest energy stretches. And these are going to be the OH and NH. Now, we all remember that alcohols and amines will hydrogen bond. Alcohols are fairly good at it. Um, since we're talking about the energy, the force constant in a particular bond, when you take that bond and you form a hydrogen bond with it, you're messing with the energy here, aren't you? It changes it. Also remember that um, hydrogen bonding is very, very dynamic. This entire structure will rearrange 10 million times a second. So you always wind up with a huge family of bond strengths when you have hydrogen bonded OHs. Because of that, the peak that you get is very broad representing each of these individual force constants. <clears throat> this is a typical OH peak. When you have one, there's no doubt about it. It's big, broad, usually around 3,400 or so. This is 2-propanol. Very nice peak. Now, you can actually see a non-bonded OH if you go to the gas phase to do your infrared spectroscopy. So this is 2-propanol in the gas phase, and this is a really clean OH stretch. In the liquid phase, as we just saw, this broadens out due to hydrogen bonding, to a great big thing. And one of the neat tricks you can do, if you take an alcohol and put it in something like carbon tetrachloride, you can see both. Here's the non-bonded, and here's the occasional bonded OH stretch. So, take-home lesson. Easy to spot, 3,400, big and broad. Now, we talk about hydrogen bonding messing up the infrared. The absolute best and hydrogen bonding among organic molecules is a carboxylic acid. Um, in a concentrated state, they can easily dimerize. When they dimerize, you have something like this, and again, you mess up badly these OA stretches. The result is the ugliest peak you've ever seen down here. It'll be big and broad. It'll wipe out everything. Carboxylic acid pretty much destroys the infrared. The carbonyl that's going to be down here somewhere, the same thing. It's going to be big and broad and ugly, kind of ruins the spectrum. But if you have something that takes up this whole region, that pretty much tells you you're dealing with a carboxylic acid. Now, it means also up here down in this region. Typically, you will get two bands, just like we did for CHs, so a symmetric and an asymmetric. Um, here, we only have one in H, and we have one band. Um, again, this is about 3,400. These are typically not as intense as OH. Um, and again, if you have an NH2, you look for two bands in the region. All right, moving up. This is just north of the 3,000 line. We're going to have first our alkyne CH stretch. If you have one of these, it's usually a very nice sharp peak at about 31, 3,200, something like that. It's very easy to pick out. Not broad like an alcohol, nice and clean and sharp just shy of the 3,000 line is where we have the CH stretch on an alkene. That's this little peak here on this side. This, this is the saturated. And so this is on the high side of 3,000. 
Again, it can be sharp. Quite often, it can be hidden. Um, there's a lot going on in your molecule. You just can't see it. For a benzene ring, we have the same sort of thing. An, uh, an SP squared CH right in here, kind of has a couple shoulders. Once again, just north of the 3,000 mile. Yeah? On that alkene one, is that last peak? Is that supposed to be a, um, no, the other one towards the 2,000 mile? Oh, is that this. Resonance? No, no, we're coming to that one. <laughs> Don't get ahead. Uh, this is actually the triple bond stretch we said would be about 2,200. <clears throat> All right, we talked about the alkane CH and suggest some more examples. Again, these are going to be on the low side of the 3,000 line. Typically, we're looking for at least two peaks. Here's a couple, here's a couple, here's more. This has a double bond, you can see the sp squared CH and the sp cubed CH here very clearly. Aldehyde, like I said, the aldehyde CH really stands out nicely. Nothing else much absorbs in this region. You'll get two peaks from an aldehyde, um, very distinctive, makes it easy to pick out when you have an aldehyde in this region. Thiol also occurs in that region, but you really don't need an infrared to find out if you have a thiol. All you have to do is smell it. It's uh, really, really bad. And uh, so, but it is in this region and uh, it's not hydrogen bonded. It's a fairly sharp peak. Uh, quite often it's not real intense. All right, the one we saw at, uh, for um, the Al I guess it was this, right here. Very nice, sharp, triple bond peak. This is the carbon-carbon triple bond stretch. Um, this is a nitrile. Now, a nitrile always gives a very nice peak. A triple bond, however, can sometimes really disappoint you. That's a triple bond stretch, so is that. Um, the, the reason that we have trouble with triple and actually even double bond stretches is a bond that is not asymmetric does not absorb infrared radiation. There's a requirement for asymmetry. The better the asymmetry, the bigger the absorbance. So a simple CH like this usually shows up. This one didn't show up very well, but the CN is very asymmetric and it shows up wonderfully. An example of this, <coughs> if we have propyne. Uh, propyne is infrared active, very nice CH stretch here, but if we had two butyne, nope, doesn't happen. Totally invisible in the infrared. Now what typically happens is something called pseudosymmetry. Here we have our triple bond and a carbon on both sides. And as far as the triple bond is concerned, well that's symmetrical enough. And so these things have very weak dipole moment and a very weak infrared band. So if you have substituted alkynes, um, seeing them is going to be really tough in the infrared. Carbonyl, like I said, infrared was designed for carbonyls. Carbonyl will be a nice, big, broad peak like this at around 1720, 1750, whatever. This is acetone. Um, Obviously, the carbon-oxygen bond is very asymmetric, isn't it? It has a great dipole moment, and it shows up wonderfully in the infrared. As you look at the family of carbonyl compounds, there's an order to it all. 
the most reactive acyl compounds will have the highest energy absorbance. Now, we really don't talk about acyl transfer until like chapter 19 or 20, but we all probably realize that acid halides and hydrides are fairly reactive things. Um, this is about 1800, and hydrides actually give you two bands um, in this region. Esters are much more tame about it. They're about 1735. Aldehydes, ketones. Then you get into the ones that are least reactive. That's carboxylic acids. And finally, amides. Amides are below the 1700 line. Um, if you are a biologist, um, when you look at an amide, they always describe it as having two bands. They call them amide 1 and amide 2. It's actually the carbonyl and then the NH bin, which occurs just south of it. Carbon-carbon double bonds. <clears throat> Once again, the symmetry problem shows up. Um, this is nicely asymmetric. And you get a fairly nice bond here, just north of 1600. Um, if you get something with pseudosymmetry, so here we have way too many carbons, um, the bond, the band, can be very, very small and hard to see. All right, so what do you do with an infrared spectrum? <coughs> oh, there's. I just want to point this out, that's right. Again, this is an example of pseudosymmetry. We have a plane of symmetry or a near plane of symmetry in the molecule. This is not infrared active. Finally, let's talk about what I pointed out on the benzene ring thing. Uh, this little family, if you look at enough, this little family of stretches here, it has to do with a lot of the ring stretches and bendings and stuff. Um, it's pretty characteristic of an air ring. These bands down here um, show up when we have a monosubstituted air ring. Two big bands and their overtones. Um, again, sometimes you see these, sometimes you see these. Sometimes you don't. It all depends. Finally, the lowest stretch, I have this, that's just what I just said, monosubstituted benzene. The lowest stretch that we're ever going to talk about is a CO. Now, the CO occurs way down here at about 1100. It's a very asymmetric, very polarized bond, so it'll be strong. But, it's right in the middle of the fingerprint region. So, the way you work with IR, if you think your molecule has a CO bond, if you already think it does, then you look at the infrared and say, well, I darn well better see a band in here somewhere. And that reassures you, okay? However, if you do a spectrum and you see a band here, you are not allowed to say, oh, it's a CO bond. When you interpret an IR spectrum, you use words like suggest, could be, possible, might be, et cetera, et cetera. And you take all of these nuances. What we're going to do in terms of analyzing spectra is we're going to look at um, the infrared and we're going to pick out the easy stuff, the obvious easy functional group absorbances. Then we're going to look at the mass spec of the same compound and we're going to look at the easy pieces that we can pull out of it. Then we're going to look at the NMR. We're going to do exactly the same thing. So we take the easy, easy to interpret pieces from several different spectroscopic methods, 
combine them, and you can almost always come up with a perfect structure. We'll see how we do that. Let's go and let's revisit chemistry 234. I hope you covered this in 234. Um, some people don't. But it's very useful when you're trying to do analysis on a compound. This is the concept of degrees of unsaturation. I remember way, way back when you looked at alkanes. Somebody pointed out to you that the simple formula for an alkane was CN H2N plus 2. So you take the number of carbons and you double it, add two, that's how many hydrogens you will have if it's an alkane. Then you went to cycloalkanes, and hopefully somebody pointed out to you that the generic formula was now CnH2n. That's because we closed it off, we lost the two hydrogens. Same thing when you do an alkene. This is also CnH2n. Whenever you have a double bond or a ring in a molecule, we refer to that as one degree of unsaturation. Now this means, this is useful because it means you can take just the simple formula and right away you can say, all right, I have four degrees of unsaturation. That's going to be either four rings, four double bonds, or a combination of the others. <clears throat> very, very useful in terms of defining what the structure is. So let's look at some examples here. Look at these guys and tell me how many degrees of unsaturation we're looking at. Our first one here has one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six carbons. How many hydrogens? I think it has like 12. Now if this was an alkane with six hydrogens, it would have 14, we're missing two, so that's one degree of unsaturation. If you just look at it, hey, we have a double bond, that's one to you. Look at this guy. How many carbons? Two, four, six, eight, ten. How many hydrogens? It's around 16, I think. All right, if this had, if this was an alkane, it would have 22 hydrogens. We're missing how many? Four, five, six. We're missing six. Therefore, we have three degrees of unsaturation. Look at it intuitively. We have a ring and two double bonds. That's three du. What's this guy? Bicyclo 221 heptane, right? How many degrees of unsaturation in that? Well, actually, the name should give it away. It's bicyclic, right? But we have six, seven carbons. We have two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, twelve hydrogens. We are missing two. Therefore, or four, therefore we have two degrees of unsaturation. 
two rings, two degrees of unsaturation. Now, if you didn't know its name, how in the world would you know this had two rings? Turns out there's a very simple rule, a very simple method. What you do is you pick a point, usually a bridgehead, and you just go. Go around until you get back to your point. That's one ring. There's our first ring. Now we're not allowed to go over the other path. We start at the same spot or somewhere on the ring, start again, and go until we hit the ring again. So this goes up and down, and that's our second ring. Bicycle. This is simple methyl cyclohexane, right? <clears throat> we have six, seven carbons. We have 12 hydrogens, or 14 hydrogens, sorry. That's one degree of unsaturation. One ring, one du. Now, lots of organic molecules have heteroatoms. So how about these two, an ether? and an alcohol. How do we handle those things? That's simple, actually. It turns out oxygen is divalent, and it just doesn't contribute at all to degrees of unsaturation. If you have an oxygen, all you have to do is look at carbons and hydrogens. Just ignore the oxygen. So this is C5H10O, which is the same as C5H10. We're missing two hydrogens, and we have one Du. This is also C5H10O. Again, one degree of unsaturation. We just ignore the oxygen. Nitrogen, you have to think about a little bit, because you have to remember a rule. Nitrogen, unfortunately, like unlike oxygen, is trivalent. So when we ignore the nitrogen, we also have to ignore one hydrogen. So you ignore one in H. Just get it out of there. So our first one here. C5H11N is the same as C5H10 or 1D. Same formula here, and once again, one ring, one degree of unsaturation. Now, whenever we work spectroscopy problems, the first thing you'll be given is the analysis. And the first thing you want to do is say, how many rings and double bonds are we dealing with? A triple bond is uh, two degrees of unsaturation. No. All right. How about cholesterol? Very quickly, how many do you use in cholesterol? Count up your carbons. That's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. 25. 25 carbons. And it has 40 hydrogens. It should have 52, so we have 6 degrees of unsaturation. Now you can just do this in your head, can't you? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 Ds. Now, back in 234, when I teach it, the one that always shows up on the exam is this one. Cubane. How many degrees of unsaturation in cubane? <clears throat> well, how many carbons? We have 
eight. How many hydrogens? We have eight. But cubane is actually easiest just to do the carbon count. We should have 18, so this is five degrees of unsaturation. Now, can you use a little rule and trace out five separate rings? Well, let's start in the front here. Let's do this guy. That's one. Now we can start at one of these corners and go around. That's two. Do the same thing down here. That's three. And we're only left with these two connectors in the back. So this is four. And this is five. That Any questions? All right, let's take and apply all of this to infrared spectroscopy. Here we have a spectrum, we have a compound with an analysis of C3H6O. First thing, if we had three carbons, how many hydrogens should we have? Double it is six, two more is eight. So we're missing two hydrogens. We have one degree of unsaturation. That means we either have a ring or we have a carbon. Now we have an oxygen in our molecule, so that's either going to be ether, an alcohol, or a carbon ether. Okay, one du. Next thing, let's just do a simple systematic analysis of the high end of our spectrum. What I'm going to do is just look at these bands. 3,400, we know that this is where we get OH and NH. We have an oxygen, it could be an alcohol, right? So we look here at 3,400. We see that little tiny diplet, but we know darn well that's not an OH, don't we? OH is big and broad, so no OH. Thirty-one hundred. We're looking for sp squared ch. We find our magic three thousand line, and there are no peaks on the uh, high side of that, are there? Kind of a shoulder, but not a real sharp peak. So we say no peak to suggest. Note the word suggest. Sp squared ch. Twenty nine hundred. That's this guy right here. Nice big peak. We have SP cubed CH. Twenty two hundred. First of all, there's no aldehyde bands here or are there? So we know that this is not an aldehyde carbonate. We know that. 2200 is where we would have triple bonds. That's right here. And there's nothing there. There are no unsymmetrical triple bonds. 1710 ish. There's our 1700 line. Big honking peak, strongest peak in the spectrum. That is a carbon. And we know the carbonyl is a ketone. It must be a ketone because it's not an aldehyde. And finally, 1610-ish, this is 1600. There's nothing here to suggest a double bond. 
So based on our infrared, we would simply look at this and say, it looks like a simple aliphatic carbonyl compound. Now, <clears throat> take and write the structure of a simple aliphatic carbonyl ketone with three carbons. We have a carbonyl, we know that. We're left with two extra carbons and six hydrogens. Only way we can put this together is to make acetone. I wasn't that simple. And it's fun. Any questions? Well, let's do it again. C7H14O. Seven carbons. How many hydrogens would that have? 14, 15, 16. We only have 14, so we have these 16. We only have 14. Again, one degree of unsaturation. <clears throat> we have a carbonyl. I'm sorry, we have an oxygen. So it could be an ether, alcohol, or carbonyl. All right, look at our standard bands here. Start off at 3,400, the high end. And do we have an OH peak? We have a little flip-lit there, but again, that's not an OH. OH should be big and broad. No OH. Look at our 3,000 line. Do we have a peak on the high side of it? No, these are all pretty much below it. So nothing really looks like SP squared carbon. 2,900. Not too surprisingly, we have nice, simple SP3 CH stretch. Nothing in the aldehyde region, is there? Nothing in our triple bond region. But here at 1700, we have a big, fat carbon. <clears throat> Finally, down at 1610, there's 15, there's 16. And nothing to indicate we would have double bonds. So once again, this looks like we have a simple aliphatic carbonyl, which is going to be a ketone. We have seven carbons. One of them is a carbonyl. Go ahead and quickly draw your structure. that was really easy. You can all draw your own very separate structures, can't you? Here are some possibilities. All of these would be consistent with the infrared as we have had it so far. Now, there are people that spend their life looking at infrared, and they will analyze every wiggle along the way. And they could probably narrow this down to, oh, two or three of these. But without looking at another form of spectroscopy, we really can't. If we looked at the NMR, we could instantly identify which one it was. 
in fact, this is the proper structure. And again, in the NMR, these would stand out like mad. We could instantly identify the isotope. Any questions? <clears throat> That's still another one. All right, we have eight carbons and only eight hydrogens. If we had eight, we would expect 18. So how many are we missing? We are missing 10 hydrogens. That's five degrees of unsaturation. Now, a rule of thumb, whenever you're doing this <clears throat> and you have lots of degrees of unsaturation, first thing you think about is a benzene ring. Every benzene ring is three double bonds and a ring. So that's four DUs per ring. So just looking at the analysis, we would say probably a benzene ring <clears throat> have an oxygen. It could be a carbonyl of some sort. <clears throat> Let's just from the analysis. Let's look at our bands. 3,400. Little tiny dip. That's not an OH, is it? The high side of 3,000, they're weak, but there certainly are peaks there. They would be consistent with SP squared CH. On the low side of 3,000, again, we have a couple weak peaks. Those would be consistent with SP cubed CH. They don't prove it. That's why the word possible is in there. <clears throat> Look in our aldehyde region. We don't have anything. Triple bond region. Nothing to indicate unsymmetrical triple bonds. But finally, here in our carbonyl region, once again, a big, strong carbonyl. Now down here is 1,600, see a really nice peak, and you see this little grouplet here, that kind of just speaks to you, that I'm a benzene ring. That's what it's saying. So it looks like we have a benzene ring and a carbonyl. All right, so what are we going to do here? Start off with our carbonyl. We have to attach something to both sides, so it's a ketone. So let's put the benzene ring on one side. Now what do we have left? We're missing one carbon and three hydrogens. By George, this is acetophenone. Now we have a ketone carbonyl. We're pretty sure we have a benzene ring. And we're missing a methyl group. Now, once again, if we looked at the NMR, we could instantly identify both the rings and these uh, isolated methyl groups. Can you go back to these? I'm sorry. No, I can't go back. I think I can. I could try.
Now, as I mentioned, um, the lecture is being recorded, right? Everyone remembers that. I did say that, right? And so, the slides and my voice up here, that's it. Can't see the pointer, whatever. Um, when we finish this, assuming that everything worked, um, I will post this and you can hit the link on Blackboard. Then you can watch this over and over and over again. It's so much fun. All right, C8, H10O. Again, eight carbons. How many hydrogens do we need? We need 18. Only have 10, so that's how many do you? Four of them. Again, anytime I see four DUs, I think benzene ring. It's just a good guess. It's a good place to start. All right. 3,400, what do we see? Finally, we see a nice, big, happy OH peak. Big, broad, happy OH peak. 3,100, so just the north side of 3,000. Yeah, we got some peaks here that are kind of hidden by the OH, but they could be SP squared CH. And since we think it might be a benzene ring, that's comforting. Low side of 3,000, nice big um, CH stretch. Nothing here where we would have aldehydes. We have an oxygen, but we decided it had to be an alcohol. <sighs> Nothing in our triple bond region, that's right here. And our carbonyl region, 1,700 is right here. And there's nothing there. Look at 1600. We have a bond. We have a few other things right here below it. Again, that's all consistent with the benzene ring. It looks like we have an alcohol containing a benzene ring. All right. Let's build our answer. Step one, we have an OH group. Put this as a CH2OH just because I could. Step two, we're pretty sure we have a benzene ring, so let's stick that somewhere. And let's see what we're missing. Well, we're missing one carbon and two hydrogens on it. So a structure that would be consistent is this one. Yeah? Um, in the 3400, you said it would be NH or OH. How, is there an indication between the two when we're looking at the... the uh, in the what? I'm sorry, which? which? Um, you said in the 3400 range, it could uh, be NH or OH. Okay. How can we yeah. identify whether it's NH or an OH? Oh, well, you don't have nitrogen in your molecule. <laughs> That's a good start. <clears throat> That's why I always give the analysis first. So this would be consistent with it, wouldn't it? Actually, this is the correct structure. It's also consistent with it. Um, and again, when we do when we do NMR in a week, well, you could tell immediately the difference between the other one and this one as our product. Immediately. All right, now we need to worry about an NH stretch because we have a nitrogen. How many degrees of unsaturation do we have? 
we have eight carbons. We would need 18 hydrogens, wouldn't we? Now, our formula has seven, but remember we have to dump the nitrogen and one hydrogen, so it really only has six. So we're missing how many? A bunch. This has six degrees of unsaturation. Six DUs. So let's start off again with a benzene ring that uses up four of them, and we have two more to deal with. Start here at the high end, 3,400. Do we have an NH stretch here? 3,400, nope, nothing's there. Nothing to indicate an NH stretch. Here at 3,100, yeah, we got a nice little peak here, nice little isolated peak. That would be consistent with SP squared CH. I don't see anything here at 2,900. That's distressing to me, but I don't see anything there. <clears throat> don't have to worry about aldehydes. But our triple bond region here at 2,200, whoa, we have a beautiful triple bond stretch. This is a classic looking nitrile triple bond stretch. Very asymmetric bond, stretches nicely, big strong thing. Could be a triple bond, carbon. We have a nitrogen our molecule, probably a nitrile. We have nothing in the carbonyl region. That's here. And here's 1,600, and these guys, yeah, we have some that would be consistent with a benzene ring. So it looks like we have a benzene ring, large number of degrees of unsaturation, probably have a nitrile. All right, we only have eight carbons to work with. This is our structure. <clears throat> now, you can just look at this and tell there's lots and lots of possible ambiguities. We could put a CH2 in between here, couldn't we? This methyl group that's on the ring could be anywhere. It could be here, it could be here. Um, those are the major possibilities of something uh, going on. Um, but this is the actual structure. Now, if we did the NMR, the fact that we have two things on the ring opposite each other, that is, para to each other, will give very distinctive splitting, and we'll be able to pick out one for substitution and be. So, uh, NMR really would help out as far as confirming this. NMR won't tell you a thing about the nitrile. The infrared does that. Let's look at one more. CAH8O. Again, 8 would require 18. We only have eight. That means how many do you use? Five of them. Probably looking at a carbonyl and a benzene. All right, start up here at 3,400. Do we have an OH peak? No, we do not. 3,100, nice little sharp thingy there. Yeah, that would be consistent with a benzene ring CH. Here we have 2,900, nice little peak. 
the one thing that really stands out in here is this thing at 2750, these two peaks. Remember, nothing else comes this low in that region except what? Aldehydes. This screams at you, I am an aldehyde. We have nothing in our triple bond region. We have a very nice carbonyl here, just shy of 1700. And it's 1610, this guy. Yeah, we have a nice double bond peak, a couple other things consistent with aerine uh, CH legends. So it looks to me like we're dealing with a benzene ring and an aldehyde. All right, so what are we going to do for our structure here? We have eight carbons to work with, just like we did in the last one. We know that one of them is going to be the aldehyde carbonyl. This is the actual structure. But based on everything we have here, we don't know if the carbon is between the ring and the carbonyl. And we don't know where on the ring the CH3 would be. Once again, all of that is shown in the NMR. Any question? All right. <clears throat> On your spectroscopy quiz, which we're taking in a couple weeks, you will get an analysis, an infrared, a mass spec, carbon NMR, and a proton NMR. And you will be able to unambiguously identify a structure. Well, right now, let's do the second part of this, and this is mass spectroscopy. Mass spectroscopy, what you're going to do is take a perfectly happy molecule, and you're going to rip it into shreds. Just rip it into shreds. You're going to measure the mass of the junk that you form when you rip it up. And from that, you're going to work backwards, try to put it back together, and come up with what the molecule was. Now, that's really tough, unless you're a mass spectroscopist. But there are things in the mass spec that are very useful and are very easy to diagnose. So we're going to learn common fragmentation. Look at it and say, oh yeah, well we have this group, we have this group, we have this group. Not going to worry about all of the 10 million other pieces you can get. Just the fragmentation that are common and easily identified. So, what you're doing in a mass spec, we're going to take a, a compound. <coughs> Actually, let's back up to our, my picture. I'm going to take the compound, stick it in this end. It's going to be hit with an electron beam. What happens is the electron beam will ionize your sample. It'll rip an electron off. That leaves the sample positive with one unpaired electron, a radical cation. Uh, these are negative plates, so these positive things are attracted towards them, and they have little holes in them. So little slits. Um, goes in a very nice little neat pattern now, and it would just keep going straight, except we put a big magnet in the way. Now because these are charged particles, they're going to be bent by the magnetic field. The heavier the particle, the less it'll be bent. 
the light particles are bent a lot. So they go through here, they get bent, and that separates them by mass. Down here you have detector, and you can pick out each of these individual beams and determine the mass to charge ratio. All right, so what this really looks like, we start off with something. We're going to rip an electron off and make a radical cation. For the parent molecule, when we just rip an electron off, we're going to call this the molecular ion. It will have the same mass as we did because we just lost an electron, that's all. So this right here gives us the mass of our molecule. Once we have our radical cation, it can do several things. We can split this guy in half, and if we do that, we get a carbon cation and a radical. Radical isn't charged, so it just goes away. We get that. But we now have a carbon cation. Again, it's a fragment of what we started with. The radical cation can also expel a neutral molecule. When it does that, it's still a radical cation. It's just missing something. Carbon cations can also expel neutral molecules form another carbon cation, again with a chunk missing. What we're going to do is look at the nature, the common chunks that we tend to lose. And from that we can tell what chunks were in our original molecule. Now this is the complicated molecule. And it's going to do a complicated thing. And I put this in here simply to show you that you can really do a lot of funny stuff in the mass spec. We're not going to do anything quite this funny. But you can do a lot of funny stuff. Uh, this is uh, an ester methyl group down here adjacent to it. When we ionize this, we form this radical cation. Now remember we said radical cations can expel a radical and leave a cation behind. A very common thing here would be to clip off the methoxy group. Clip that off as a methoxy radical and we would be left with this thing. I hope you recognize this as a very stable carbocation. It's an oxonium ion. Um, in, in the mass spec, you're looking for stable ions, stable carbon cations. Again, oxonium ions are among the most stable. The bizarre thing that this thing can do is an internal rearrangement where instead of this expelling the radical, it can expel the neutral molecule but it does it in a very special way. This hydrogen is transferred up, this bond goes in, this bond goes down. It's called a McLafferty rearrangement. And we wind up with a radical cation here, expelled our neutral methanol, and this is our fragment. Now in the mass spec, what you do is you will identify the molecular weight of your parent ion. That's M plus. So M plus here weighs 150. When we lose the methoxy radical, we're losing a piece that weighs 31. And that will give us this fragment that weighs 119. When we expel methanol, we're losing a fragment that weighs 32 to give us something at 118. So, once again, what we do in our spectrophotometer, or we ionize, we bend, and we detect. 
Um, the way that we actually detect, you know, move this thing back and forth, what you do is change the strength of your magnet. So you start off at one magnetic field, it's electromagnet, start it off low, go high, and it scans through all the different um, masses as you go. This then goes up on a little plot. We're going to do mass to charge ratio, but the charge is always one in our class, our class anyway. And we're going to look at the relative intensities. So a real spectrum looks like this. This is for our uh, methyl ester. Again, our molecular ion here is at 150. We lost a chunk that weighed 31 to get down here to 119. Lost methanol, 32, to get down to 118. We identify this as our molecular ion. We call that M+. The highest peak in the spectrum, by definition, is called the base peak. So everything is scaled to the uh, strongest peak in the spectrum. All right, so let's look at um, something that's a little bit less complicated than this. Whenever, this is the mass spec of toluene. Toluene has a mass of 92, so methyl benzene. Um, when we look at the mass spec, we see a nice peak at 92. That would correspond to toluene itself. And we see a peak at M minus 1. Now think about what that is. If we have our toluene radical cation. It can spit out a hydrogen atom and become a benzyl carbocation. What is one of the most stable carbocations? It's a benzyl. Resonance stabilized, etc. In fact, this goes one step further. In the mass spec, virtually any time you form a benzyl carbocation, it undergoes an internal rearrangement to form the tropylium ion. Now, tropylium ion can spit out C2H2, that's acetylene, neutral molecule, and form this little thing with a weight of 65, and that's what we see in this spectrum. We see toluene at 92, propylium ion at 91, and this little thing down here at 65. Basically, whenever you see a big, happy base peak at 91, it's telling you, I have a benzyl group in my molecule. 91 means I have benzyl. Somewhere. Very, very common peak. <clears throat> Speaking of common peaks, these are things that we see often. Okay? Um, if you lose one, that's a hydrogen. M minus 15 is something we look for a lot. Methyl groups tend to get clipped off easily. Methyl group weighs 15 you look for a loss of 15. An OH would be 17. That's not as common. Neither is a methoxy. Um, halogens are always a problem. Um, these two cations here are the really big ones. Those are the ones that are important. We've seen tropylium ion here, C7H7. And this guy, 43. Um, this thing can be formed from aldehydes, especially. Um, this, of course, is our tropylium ion down here. But 
a mass of 43. Whenever you see that, it's going to tell you you either have an isopropyl group or you have what's called the acyllium ion. If you have a methyl carbonyl in your molecule anywhere, you will see an acyllium ion. If you have an isopropyl group anywhere, you will see the isopropyl cation, and again, both of them are at 42. All right, let's look at some examples. Here we have a molecule. <clears throat> Our molecular ion is here at 58. Our base peak is down here at 43. Now, what's the difference between 58 and 43? It's a 15, isn't it? So this is our molecular ion. This is our base peak. And it's loss of a methyl group. Now really, that's about all you can tell by looking at this mass spec. The molecular weight and the fact that we can lose a methyl group to form a peak at 43. However, so our molecular weight is 58. We lose a methyl group. It's a stable ion at 43. Look at our analysis. C4H10. C4H10. How many degrees of unsaturation? That would be 8, 10. There are none. So right away, you know this is a simple alkane, isn't it? That means that this ion here at 43 is most likely an isopropyl group. So we have no oxygens, we have no carbonyls, now, we would know that instantly if we looked at the IR, wouldn't we? This would just be a simple alkane. In fact, this is what it looks like. And all we're doing in the mass spec is clipping off one of these methyl groups to form the isopropyl carbon cation. Right? Let's do another one. This also has a mass of 58. This also has a base peak at 43. My gosh, it's deja vu all over again. So here's our molecular ion. We're forming a stable peak here at 43 as our base peak. And again, it's loss of a methyl group. So we need a little more information. Our molecular weight is, in fact, 58. We could lose something and form a stable peak. Lose a methyl group, form a stable peak at 43. And again, we recognize that as either a psyllium or isopropyl. All right, our analysis. C3H6O. And just for the heck of it, we took a peak at the infrared. And by George, it's got a big honking peak at 1725. We're dealing with a ketone here, aren't we? Because we're dealing with a carbonyl compound, most likely the ion at 43 is the acylium. So, how many carbons are we missing? One. 
one carbon and three hydrogens. That's our methyl group. Take the acetylene ion, put the methyl group back, and you get acetone. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Are we trying to find the ion or are we trying to find the original structure? Well, in the mass spec, um, at this level, taking the mass spec and determining an actual structure is almost impossible. What we're trying to do is just come up with bits of information that we can combine with the infrared and the NMR that we'll do next week. And from the easy part in each of them, I wrote a book called Practical Spectroscopy. It's actually available on um, Blackboard if you want to uh, take a look at it. But um, it, the concept is you take the easy stuff from every method, combine them, and boom, you got your structure. It almost always works. All right, a little more complicated. 120, that's our molecular ion. We lose 15 to get to our base peak. It's loss of a methyl group, right? <clears throat> if we start here at our molecular ion and go down to 77, how much is that? See, it makes you good at math at the same time. That's an M minus 43. Ah, 43, a magic number. So this could be isopropyl. It could be acylium. This is probably a methyl group. Molecular waste 120, loss of a methyl, and loss of something that weighs 43. Now we're going to look at the IR. Again, a big peak at 1725, so we have a carbonyl. And our analysis is C8H8O. C8H8, we should have 18. We're missing 5 degrees of unsaturation. Our rule tells us we think benzene rate. Right? So we have a benzene ring and a carbonyl. That's fine. All right. If we have a benzene ring here and we have an acylium ion, how much does this thing weigh with nothing attached? Six times 12 is 72, plus 5 is 77. How about that? So what do we have to do to make this molecule? We simply take these two fragments and put them together. question? I think I've got a couple more here. Oh, what is this thing? Well, if we clip our methyl group off, what are we left with? This acylium ion. So we have this oxocarbocation as well as the acylium ion here are two major peaks. All right, this one is cute because these are actually two molecular ions here. That's two of them. One at 170, one at 172. Now, 
we go way down here, and we hit a big honking peak at 91. Turns out that this is M minus 80, taking the average of the two, more like the lions. Whenever we see a peak at 91, what do we think of? Benzyl unit, propylene. So our molecular weight, we have two molecular ions, one at 170, one at 172. We lose 80, and we form a peak at 91 that most likely is the tropillium ion or the benzyl carbocation. Our analysis, C787Br. Now it makes sense, doesn't it? What's the average molecular weight of bromine? It's 80. We have just clipped off a bromine here. And when we did that, we were left with something that weighs 91, probably a tropillium ion, which came from a benzyl group. Now, I want you to pay particular attention to these two molecular ions. If you know, they're the same height. You can't see them very well, but they're the same height, aren't they? Think about bromine. Bromine exists as two isotopes, a 79 and an 81, in the same ratio, one-to-one -one ratio. So whenever you have a bromine, you're going to see two molecular ions separated by two mass units. <clears throat> if we put these together, we have a benzyl group here, weighs 91. We have a bromine that consumes all of our carbons. This is simply benzyl bromide. Now, the two halogens that you have to think about in the mass spec, bromine, where we have a one-to-one -one ratio of our two isotopes, and the other one that's common is chlorine. <clears throat> For bromine, we will get two peaks, an M and an M plus two. For chlorine, we will get two peaks, an M and an M plus two, but these two are equal intensity. This is a 3 to 1 intensity. So immediately you can tell if you have a bromine or a chlorine in your molecule. All right, <clears throat> let's take what we know about infrared and what we know about mass spec, and let's combine them and do a simple problem, just one. doesn't want to, does it? Sometimes PowerPoint crashes at the strangest times. All right. Here we have the infrared spectrum of something. I tell you, its molecular weight is 86. Wait, that's the, oh, we're not supposed to be there yet. Hang on. All right. This is acting up for me. I'm sorry. Okay, here's the problem. Analytical, C5H10O. C5H10O. 
5 times 2 is 10 plus 2 more. We have 1 degree of unsaturation, right? Have an oxygen. Could be an OH, could be a carbonyl, could be an ether. The mass spec. We have a peak here at 86. That corresponds to C5H10O. Let's look at this in a little more detail. We have an 86, a 71, and a 43. Now, this is M minus 15, isn't it? So we have a methyl group we can clip out. This is a 43. It's either going to be a psyllium or an isopropyl carbocation. Okay? That's our molecular ion. Here's an M minus 15. Here's our base peak, which is either a psyllium or isopropyl. That's the simple stuff we want to take away from the mass spec. All right. Our molecular weight is age 6. Loss of a methyl group. Base peak at 43. Could be either a psyllium or isopropyl. Look at the infrared. <clears throat> we have one degree of unsaturation. We know that. Start up here at 3,400. Do we have an OH peak? No OH. So it's not an alcohol, for sure. 3,100. Not really much on the north side of 3,000. Could be a little shoulder but nothing that screams at me that it is. Probably not an SP squared CH. Nice, big, happy SP cubed CH, however. <clears throat> we have nothing here where we'd expect to see aldehydes. We have nothing here at 2200 for triple bonds. But at about 1710, we have a big, happy carbonyl. At 1600, I don't see anything here that looks like a double bond stretch. So I would simply conclude here that we're dealing with a ketone carbonyl. Now, a ketone carbonyl can clip out a 43. It can also lose a methyl group, can't it? So that kind of sounds a lot like we're dealing with a methyl ketone. That's a good guess. So here's the pieces that we can deal with. We have a methyl group. We have the acyllium ion, or we could still have the isopropyl group. We're only dealing with five carbons. That's one, two, three, four, five. So try to put these together. Well, the simplest way to do it <clears throat> would be just do this. Make a methyl ketone and put a three carbon chain. That would be totally consistent with everything that we've said here. It's wrong, but it would be totally consistent. The actual structure is this guy. And if you look at this structure, you can see why we had such a very nice peak at 43, can't you? Because this guy can split right here and form two things that both weigh 43, the isopropyl 
and the acylate. Now, if we had the NMR, if we only had an NMR, we would be easily distinguishing between the two. Turns out that the isopropyl group has a very, very distinctive appearance in the NMR. We would see the methyl group and the isopropyl group very, very clearly. The long chain would look totally different in the NMR. Any questions? I know a lot of this sounds strange because you haven't done it before. Um, but the more you work with it, actually it uh, gets to be, makes sense and be fun. When we combine NMR with it next week, I think you'll see that it makes a really powerful analytical method. Any questions? All right. I think I'm done.